When I made a video about who really controls your Linux distros, I was expecting a few strong opinions and the comments did not disappoint. I get it. Linux means different things to different people. For some, it's freedom. For others, it's control. And for many more, it's this quiet promise that we are not just another cog in someone else's machine. A lot of top comments quickly stuck with me. They were bold, brutally honest, and raised questions that deserve more than just a quick reply. So in this video, I've pulled together the comments that got the most attention. And I'm giving you what I believe is an honest, grounded response based on the current state of Linux from someone who's invested his every waking hour in the ecosystem for the last few years. Let's get into it. Question number one, is transparency more important than democracy in open source? What this person actually said was, for me, open process transparency is much more important than open governance. So here are my thoughts. This is not wrong and in many cases they are absolutely right to feel this way. In open source, transparency is often the bedrock. We can audit the code, track decisions, read mailing lists, view commit histories. You may not have a vote, but you can see exactly what's going on. And that alone prevents a lot of abuse. Democracy, on the other hand, is rare in open source. Projects like Debian or Fedora tried to implement it. But it comes with bureaucracy, slower decision making, and sometimes political gridlock. Most successful projects rely on a meritocracy or benevolent dictator model where experienced developers steer the ship, but the process is still visible to everyone. The real power in open source isn't always in voting, it's in fucking. If the leadership becomes toxic or closed off, you can take the code and go your own way. That's where transparency becomes your best weapon. It lets you see when it's time to act. So yeah, transparency doesn't just matter more. In most projects, it's the only thing you're guaranteed to get. And sometimes that's just enough to keep things honest. Question number two, are corporations quietly taking over Linux? Now this person said, I'm afraid corporations will shape the entire Linux community as they wish. It is naive to imagine big tech doesn't already have a plan for Linux. Well, I would say that fear isn't baseless. And it's not naive to think this way. Corporations already play a massive role in Linux. Over 85% of the Linux kernel is already been developed by paid engineers. Many from Intel, Google, AMD, Red Hat, and yes, even Microsoft. These companies contribute because they need Linux to power their servers, devices, and infrastructure. So this isn't charity, it's business. But this bit is important. Linux isn't one project. It's an ecosystem. Red Hat might influence systemd. Canonical might push Snap. But they don't control Linux as a whole. No one does. And when a company oversteps, just look at what happened with CentOS shifting to stream. The community reacts. Projects fork, users leave, alternatives emerge. That's the built-in defense mechanism. Corporate influence is real, but ownership isn't absolute. So yeah, big tech has a plan for Linux. But the beauty of open source is we can see it and we can walk away from it. And that's not something you get on Windows or Mac OS. Question number three, should users have a say in how Linux distros are run? This person actually said open source does not and should not mean governance. People are stupid statistically. Now, this is blunt, but let's talk about the real issue here. Open source does not promise democracy. It promises access. Anyone can read the code, modify it, and fork it. But running a project will often fall to people who build it. And honestly, that's often a good thing. Take Linux Mint. Clem runs it like a ship with a strong captain. The community gives feedback, but ultimately, he steers. It works because he listens, but also because he has a vision. Now, compare that with something like Debian, which is fully democratic. Developers vote on leadership and major changes. But that also means slow progress, internal debates, and sometimes gridlock. So, should users have a say? Yes, but not always the final say. Because when too many voices try to steer the ship, what you get is chaos, not direction. I believe open source thrives because leadership can be clear but accountable. The real check on power isn't voting, it's choice. If a distro stops reflecting your needs, the exit door is always open. And in Linux, that's a feature, not a flaw. Question number four, 
How much control do we really have over our Linux distro? Well, this person said, your choice of distro is mostly a cosmetic choice. You know what? That's not totally wrong, but it's also not the whole story. At the core, most Linux distros share the same DNA, the Linux kernel, GNU tools, and increasingly systemed. These low-level components are maintained upstream by people and companies you probably do not vote for. So yeah, when you distro hop, you're often changing the wrapping and not the engine. But here is the nuance. You have control over what you accept. If you don't like systemed, you can use div1. If you hate snap, avoid Ubuntu. If you want a total rebuild from source control, try Gentoo. These aren't cosmetic differences. They are architectural. Still, it's true that some layers are hard to escape. Proprietary firmware blobs, kernel driver dependencies, even Wayland versus X11, all have upstream gatekeepers. So no, we don't have absolute control. But we have enough leverage to choose what trade-offs we live with. In the end, you control your environment through your choices, not your illusions. This is cosmetic sometimes, but it is absolutely strategic. Question number five. How do distros like Ubuntu or Red Hat make money? The person said, maybe you could explain in more detail how companies like Canonical make money. What's their business model? I think this is a great question and understanding the money is key to understanding their decisions. Let's start with Red Hat. They sell enterprise-grade Linux support. You're not buying the software, you're paying for guaranteed stability, long-term updates, and certified support teams. Now that's why companies and governments trust them. Fedora is their testing ground, and Red Hat Enterprise Linux is the polished product. Now, Canonical, the makers of Ubuntu, they play a similar game but with more commercial ambition. They offer support subscriptions, cloud services, IoT solutions, and tools like Landscape for managing fleets of machines. Ubuntu is free, but the enterprise version is what pays the bills. They also package Snap and push it hard because they control the Snap store, meaning they get to monetize distribution channels, app listings, and potentially enterprise-level delivery. In both cases, the business model is clear. Give the software for free, sell the trust and tools to run it at scale. So when you see decisions that feel user-hostile, like Snap or changes to CentOS, it's not just evil intentions, but productizing open source in a way that pays the bills. And whether or not we like it, that's what keeps full-time developers on these projects. And that's what keeps the lights on. Question number six, is Ubuntu still relevant or just corporate bloat now? Well, this person actually said Ubuntu is completely redundant, having no technical reasons to exist. That's a bold take. And I get where it's coming from. Technically, Ubuntu isn't doing anything you can't get somewhere else. It's based on Debian, the desktop is GNOME, and most of the core tools are shared across distros. But here's the thing. Ubuntu's relevance was never just about technical uniqueness. It was about accessibility, polish, and predictability. When it launched in 2004, it brought Debian to the mainstream with same defaults, regular releases, and actual marketing. It changed the Linux desktop forever. Today, yes, the Snap integration is annoying. The canonical decisions don't always reflect the community feedback. And some users feel like it's drifting into enterprise-first territory. But despite all that, Ubuntu is still the base for countless other distros. Linux Mint, Purple S, Zorin, Elementary, all built on Ubuntu's groundwork. And in the server and cloud world, Ubuntu is still one of the top players. So is it bloated? At times, yes. Is it redundant? Not if you see it as an ecosystem foundation rather than just a distro. So love it or hate it, Ubuntu still shapes the direction of the Linux world more than most of us would want to admit. Question number seven, can we trust leaders like Clem, that's for Linux Mint, or should we worry? Now, this is a fair question, because in open source, trust is often personal. Clem, the lead behind Linux Mint, has earned a lot of goodwill. For over a decade, he's made smart, user-focused decisions. He's kept Mint stable, fast, and private without chasing trends. He's resisted Snap, he's refined Cinnamon, and always explains the why behind changes. This has built a lot of trust. But here's the thing, Linux Mint isn't a democracy. 
It's a benevolent dictatorship. And like all projects run by individuals or small teams, it relies heavily on the vision and integrity of its leadership. So yes, we can trust Clem for now, but trust in open source shouldn't be blind. It should be earned continually and backed by transparency and Fox as safety nets. If tomorrow Clem changed direction in a way the community hated, Mint could be fucked. Just like Mint came from GNOME 2 or Rocky Linux rose after CentOS shifted. In open source, the moment you can't trust the people in charge, you don't have to wait for an election. You fuck, you leave, you build. So admire leaders but never idolize them. That's the balance. Now the last question is, is Community Linux dead? This person's actual take was, Community Linux is nearly dead. Nowadays, Mafia G controls it. Again, I get where this feeling is coming from. When you see Red Hat tightening its grip, Canonical pushing Snap, or big names influencing the kernel, it's easy to feel like Linux has been quietly absorbed into the corporate machine. But in reality, Community Linux isn't dead. It's just quieter than the noise around. You won't always hear about the devs behind Void Linux, MX Linux, or Attix, but they're out there building, patching, and maintaining systems that have zero corporate influence. Projects like NixOS, EndeavorOS, or Alpine aren't chasing investors. They are building ecosystems. Even distros like Linux Mint or Garuda walk a careful line between convenience and independence. Yes, the loudest part of Linux are now tied to enterprise. But the community is still alive, still building, and still free. The power of Linux has never been in any one company. It's in the fact that if you don't like what's happening, you can walk away and still be part of something real. So no, community isn't dead. It's just not trending. And maybe that's what keeps it pure. Well, that would be it. These are some of the questions that I failed to doubt. If you have other questions you would love me to answer, drop them in the comments. But as always, like this video and share it. Until the next one, stay safe out there.